Hello, welcome to Revelations in Grace. I'm John Paul, and today we are continuing our series on preterism, and this one's titled The Resurrection of the Dead. In the last episode of this series, we looked at Jesus' promise to return within his disciples' generation in Matthew 24, and I led you through my thought process as I was trying to make sense of it. And we asked the question, could Jesus have been telling a lie? And we eliminated that. The Bible promises that no deceit would be found on the Messiah's lips. We asked the question, well, did Jesus give an incorrect guess? And we proved that Jesus did not use the language of a guess. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away. The heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This isn't the language you use when you're making a guess. That's the language of confidence. We asked the question, was God's plans thwarted? And while God has the right to withdraw a threat or a blessing, when he gives an oath, he never withdraws it, regardless of human action. And he made a promise not just to return in that generation, but we see in Hebrews and in Revelation, he promises to return without delay and in a very little while. Finally, we wondered if Jesus was misunderstood, and we looked at two common interpretations scholars have given for his words. We also looked at how the disciples understood Jesus, and we showed that the disciples, by their words and actions, understood Jesus to mean that he would return in their present generation. And Jesus would have understood if they had misunderstood him, and he had no intentions for them to misunderstand. And since Jesus did not correct them, that's exactly what he intended to communicate. So the only way to read Matthew 24 is that Jesus was making a promise that he would return within their generation and lifetimes. And that brings us to the study for today. Because Jesus didn't just promise to return in their generation. He promised some other big stuff too. In Matthew 16, 27 through 28, it says, For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. You know, and then he goes on to say, Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they have seen the Son of Man coming in his reign, his kingdom. And in John 6, 40, it says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus made a couple promises here. He promised that when he returned, he would reward each according to his work, and he also promised that he would raise him up on the last day. So there's this idea of the judgment and the resurrection. Well, those are two big topics, and the disciples understood those topics as having been included in the promise of what he would do in that generation. If you look at 2 Timothy 4.1, Paul says, I do fully testify then before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his manifestation and reign. Jesus was about to come back and judge the living and the dead when he arrived. And that's that Greek word mellow, the about to, which everywhere else in the New Testament is supposed to be translated about to, and is for non end times verses, but for some reason translators have left out that word about to for the end times verses, not understanding how to make sense of it. Also in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Here's the idea that when Christ comes back, the dead who have been waiting in their graves for him will come out of their graves uh, and be resurrected. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, it says, But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Here's the idea that when Jesus returns from his period of being away, that he's going to raise the dead. Finally, in Acts 24, 15, uh, we have Paul saying, having a hope in God in which they themselves also await that there is about to be a resurrection both of the just and of the unjust. There's that word mellow again, and it's in the present infinitive form. He's saying that there is about to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Peter also says the same things. He says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. 
Notice there that Jesus is ready to judge. He's at the point of doing it. For this is why the gospel is preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So here's Peter saying that the end of all things is at hand. Now, all things would include the resurrection. It includes the judgment, which he was ready to perform, and the resurrection. Those, those two ideas are inseparable. The idea that the dead will come out of their graves, they'll receive a judgment, and then they'll either go on to the lake of fire or to heaven. So you have this idea where the disciples are all saying, when Jesus comes back, he's going to raise the dead. But that, that raises the ante of this, because Jesus promised to return in that generation. So if Jesus promised that he would return in that generation, and we've realized we can't get around that, and he promised to raise the dead when he came back, well, then that means the dead are going to be raised in that generation. So that's hard to accept. I mean, what do we do with that? Um, what I don't want to do is jump to the conclusion that this resurrection didn't happen, and so Jesus was a false prophet and Christianity is false, right? We don't want to just jump to that. Jesus obviously made a promise here, uh, and the disciples understood that promise under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to mean that the resurrection would happen. So we have to do some work now. we got to do some study of figuring out, okay, well, how could this have been fulfilled? I was dealing with this question a few years ago, uh, probably about three years ago, when I started piecing together preterism, and I, I thought, this is an impossible conundrum. How are we going to get through this? And I felt like the Lord offered me some help at that time to help put things together in a way that answers the problem. But it challenges some key understandings we have of how we perceive the resurrection. You know, when we picture dead bodies coming out of the ground and, uh, and reigning on earth forever and ever with immortal bodies, you know, we picture these, this zombie-like apocalypse where <laughs> everyone, you know, comes out of the dirt and they're like living on earth forever. But, they, but if that's true, you got to ask, well, where are they now? I mean, obviously, we don't have 2,000-year-old people wandering around the earth. So what happened to them? So it turns out that this idea of the resurrection might not be what it preaches in the Bible. Uh, there might be another way of understanding the resurrection that can actually do justice to the text and we could imagine has been fulfilled. But we're going to go through and challenge three key assumptions about what this resurrection would be like before we can do that. So the first of them is that we're not meant to live on earth forever. You know, God didn't have a plan that when we come out of our graves, we're going to be wandering the earth forever. He planned for us to come to heaven with him. He wants us to be in heaven forever. You know, a lot of people think that heaven is like a temporary waiting place until the resurrection comes, that when we die today, we go to heaven, and then sometime in the distant future when Jesus returns, we'll come out of heaven and back to earth in new physical bodies. But that's not how the Bible describes it. We're meant for heaven. Uh, John 14, 2, 3 says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also." Here Jesus is talking about a second coming. He's going to go away to his father's house. You know, we, we can probably imagine that that's heaven. It's kind of hard to imagine that that's on earth, especially since he's going away from earth to prepare it. Um, but he goes to this house while he's, you know, while we're waiting on him to return. And he's building this house for us in heaven. And then he's going to come again and take us to himself that where he is, we may be, may be also. So he's in heaven. He wants us to come to heaven where he is. So, and this, this lines it precisely with the event of the resurrection. When Jesus returns, he will resurrect the dead. And he says when he returns, he wants to take them to his father's house. So we see, first of all, that Jesus isn't meaning for them to live an endless life on this planet earth. In the resurrection, he's wanting to take them up to heaven. In Philippians 3.20, it says, But our citizenship is in heaven, 
and from it we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is in heaven. Our citizenship is there. We're not meant to be citizens of earth forever. We're meant to ultimately live in heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1, it says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. First Peter, oh, uh, well, before I go on, notice that, that that house is eternal. You know, he, he's, this isn't a temporary house that's going to sustain us until the resurrection. This is the eternal house he's made for us in the heavens. First Peter 1, 4, he's provided an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. John 17, 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. While it's true that God has a purpose and a plan for us here on earth, and that we get to partner with him and spread his kingdom and make earth a little more like heaven, the sense I get from these scriptures is that ultimately we're going to end up in heaven. And that brings us to our second assumption. What happened to the disciples before the resurrection? Right? Because if Jesus was busy preparing a place for them in his father's house while he was away, and if the disciples died while they were waiting on Jesus to prepare these rooms, did they go up to heaven before it was finished? Or what happened? Well, and this is something that's a little less known in in church uh, circles, but in the Old Testament, when people would die, they would go to a place called Sheol or Hades. It was kind of described as the underworld of the earth, but it's described as a place of no consciousness, a place where the dead are asleep. And this idea is kind of that, you know, our spirits are meant to have a body, to have consciousness and to function. And the idea is that when, when, you, when your earthly body dies, that spirit has no way to be conscious. And so it goes into a sleeping state in a place called Sheol or Hades. And while it's in this place, it's waiting for a new body. And so this idea that there's going to be a resurrection is this promise that that spirit is going to receive a new body, a new spiritual body, not an, earth, not an earthly fleshly body, but a spiritual body, so that it can regain consciousness and go into heaven to, to enjoy these rooms that Jesus has prepared for us. So this, there's this idea of this temporary waiting place, and that's Hades or Sheol. They're the same place in, in Psalms 16.10. It's quoting from David, and he calls it Hades. Um, sorry, in Acts 2.31, he's quoting from David in Psalms, and, he's, and he describes it as Hades, whereas Psalm 16.10 describes it as Sheol. So, uh, and what I can do to prove this is if you look at Revelation 20, when the resurrection, the great white throne judgment is happening, where are the dead being resurrected from? Are they coming out of their peaceful homes in heaven to a new life on earth and new bodies? No, it says the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. It doesn't say death and heaven gave up the dead that were in them. It says death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. The people who were waiting for the resurrection were waiting in Hades. Well, 1 Corinthians 15 says much the same thing. In verses 52 through 57, Paul says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible will have put on incorruption and this mortal will have poured on put on immortality, then what is written will happen. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is Paul quoting from there? He's quoting from Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. So Paul is describing this future resurrection that's, that he's so excited about coming that there's going to be a trumpet blast. And when it comes, the dead will be raised with incorruptible bodies and they'll be rescued from their, 
from death. And this place where they're being held is called Hades. It's called Sheol. It's not, they're not being rescued from a peaceful life in heaven back to a new life on earth. No, they're being rescued from this kind of, you know, underworld. <laughs> so, um, and that leads us to the third assumption we're going to challenge, which is what kind of body will we have in the resurrection? Right? Because we imagine when the scripture says we're going to have new bodies and he's going to give us a new body. And when we read things like, uh, let me find the verse real quick. Verses like Philippians 3.21, where it says, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Talking about Jesus's resurrected body. We think to ourselves, wow, Jesus, our body is going to be like the body that Jesus had when he was raised from the dead. And of course, it was tangible, physical. People could see him and touch him. So, of course, we're going to have these kind of tangible bodies. Um, so, if that's the case, then at least we should have a moment in history where thousands of people come out of their graves, at least for a minute, before they go on to heaven, and we all see them, right? And so, you know, Paul is asked basically the same question in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, in verse 35, it says, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? So uh, who's ever asking this question is wondering like, okay, what, what kind of a body are they going to have? Are they going to look just like they did before? Are they going to, is it going to be made up of the same kind of flesh uh, with blood and bones and stuff? Is it going to be the same? And Paul's answer is, in, okay, so I'm jumping around the place a little bit here. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 44 and 49, he says, it is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. It's like a seed. You know, our natural earthly body dies, but when we get raised up in the resurrection, we receive not an earthly natural body, but a spiritual body. And it says in verse 49, and just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Okay, so we got two adjectives here. We got a spiritual body, and we got a heavenly man. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 3, it's also talking about the resurrection. If you, you have to step back into chapter 4 to see that context. But in chapter 5, he's continuing with that context. And he says, We will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself. We long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. We will put on our heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. You know, when people imagine... Uh, us being in heaven. Sometimes they imagine us being like these translucent ghosts who are floating around, just spirits floating around in heaven. I don't believe that's the picture that, uh, that Paul had of what the afterlife was like. He didn't picture heaven being like translucent ghosts floating around. He pictured tangible stuff. He pictured, he pictured um, uh, the bodies of the angels. Now, in Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30, Jesus says, At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given a marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, this is something I want to point out because we know that angels are primarily invisible, right? They're primarily invisible. But on certain occasions, they can become tangible, they can become visible, or some form in between. You know, you remember the the two angels and Sodom and Gomorrah and how they ate dinner uh, with Lot and his family. And do you remember, you know, God walking with Abraham? Uh, and do you remember uh, like when Jesus spoke, when God spoke about his son being baptized and his voice sounded like thunder? Or when Elijah saw the armies of angels in heaven? You know, these are cases where these spiritual bodies, which are primarily invisible, on certain occasions have become visible and tangible. Like remember when Jacob wrestled with the angel and the angel broke his leg. That's an example of a tangible spiritual body. It has real effect. There's this idea that in heaven, they're not just a bunch of invisible spirits floating around. They, they're they visible, they're tangible. They're just not tangible to us on earth all the time. They can be if they're allowed or if or if they want to be or if we're allowed to see them. But for the most part, they're invisible to us. And we can even explain Jesus this way. You know, Jesus had a new spiritual body. It was tangible. I mean, uh, 
Thomas put his hand in the side of Jesus and saw his wounds and everything. Um, but that same body is now up in heaven. It floated up to heaven and is invisible to us today. That same tangible body that was supposedly touchable. So when we picture this spiritual body, when you hear words like heavenly body and spiritual body and like the angels, we're picturing something that is primarily invisible but can be visible or tangible if they wish it were allowed. Now, N.T. Wright believes that when it describes the word spiritual body, it's not talking about the type of body or its substance. It's talking about the power behind the body. He quotes here in his, uh, this I got this article off of beliefnet.com, faiths slash Christianity slash 2004. Anyway, they, I'll post a link to it um, in the description below. But he says, a lot of scholars seem to look at the Pauline phrase which is in Greek, is phenomatic body, and in English is spiritual body. And they seem to think the resurrection won't be physical at all. The word spiritual in Corinthians 1 and 1 Corinthians 15 comes from the Greek phenuma, but the word is phenumaktikos. Greek adjectives that end in kos do not describe the substance out of which something is made. They describe the force that is animating the thing in question. It's the difference between saying on the one hand, is this a wooden ship or a steel ship? And saying on the other hand, is this a nuclear powered ship or a steam powered ship? And the sort of adjective is of the latter type. It's a spirit powered body, but it's still a ship. And so he goes on to argue that we're gonna have physical tangible bodies. And, and you know, I don't disagree with this necessarily. Um, What's interesting is that it doesn't necessarily answer the question Paul's being asked. He's not being asked who's going to give life to the dead, right? I, I think he assumed that everyone knew that it was the Holy Spirit who was going to give life to the dead. What they didn't know was what kind of substance these bodies would have. That's what they're being asked. That's what Paul's being asked. You know, what kind of body will we have? <clears throat> so... Uh, so when you look at this question in context, it should be taken as a description of substance, not, not, just, uh, not just the animating power. But since this body can, is, is subject to change, since it can be invisible or tangible or, um, or invisible, then he describes it by the power animating it rather than by its, its makeup. But even Jesus' body can be explained this way when he came out of the grave, he had his new spiritual body. And uh, in Luke 24, 31, it says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. So we got Jesus's tangible body just vanishing from their sight, just like that. And in John 20, 26, it says, eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. So we have Jesus in a, in a physical, tangible body, but teleporting through walls. And then we got Luke 24, 37 through 39, and it says, They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. I mean, obviously, if you got someone teleporting through walls and disappearing in front of your sight, you might think they're a ghost. But he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So Jesus' new spiritual body had flesh and bones. They could touch it, but it could also turn invisible and it could also teleport and it could also go up to heaven and be invisible to us today. And, you know, it is true. Philippians 3.21 says that our lowly bodies will be transformed to be like Christ's glorious body. And I don't have a problem with that. He can have a spiritual heavenly body like the angels and it be tangible with flesh and blood but also be invisible and intangible if he wants and and that's the way our bodies are going to be too so then the conclusion this brings us to is one that in the resurrection we're ultimately meant to head up to heaven not live on earth forever two in the meantime the disciples had to wait in sheol or hades until that happened and three when they got their bodies those new spiritual bodies could be tangible, invisible, or some state in between. 
And this brings us to how we can interpret the resurrection. The resurrection has a possibility of being invisible, visible, or some state in between. What's really interesting is we have an event described by three different people in history that seems to describe just such a resurrection. I'm going to quote from Daniel Maurice, who is the author of RevelationsRevolutions.com, and he has a quote from this in one of his articles. It says, In AD 66, when the Jewish revolt began, Nero Caesar was in Greece building a canal. Concerning the construction of this waterway, Cassius Dio writes, When the first workers touched the earth, blood spouted from it. Groans and bellowings were heard, and many phantoms appeared. Nero himself thereupon grasped a mattock, and by throwing up some of the soil, fairly, fairly compelled the rest of them to imitate him. That's in Cassius Dio, Roman History, 63-16. In recording this same event, Suetonius indicates that as Nero broke the ground, the sound of a trumpet was heard. That's in Suetonius, Lives of the Twelve Caesars, uh, 6 19 the fact that a trumpet was heard at a time in which the dead were raised is a clear fulfillment of 1 Corinthians 15.52. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. This is monumental. We have a period in history where, and if you don't know the significance of 66 AD, this is the year that Josephus, Tacitus, and other historians saw visions of armies of flaming chariots and angels in the clouds coming against Jerusalem. And one person even describes a large figure in the front of it. So we, this is when most preterists imagine that Jesus returned. I know there are preterists out there who say that there was no historical fulfillment. It was all symbolic in the destruction of Jerusalem. I personally believe that it wasn't merely symbolic. Jesus literally returned. He was visible to the people. And uh, in AD uh, 66, the, as he's appearing on the clouds, in another part of town, this, this event is going on. These, these uh, spirits are raising out of the ground, and there's the sound of this trumpet blast. And there's this idea that, that the resurrection is happening. So Josephus also records the event of Jesus coming in the clouds. I'm going to read the whole thing. So Josephus was a Jewish historian. Uh, he was a general, and he got captured by the Romans, and he ended up writing a, an historical account of the things he witnessed in the war. So this is from Antiquities of the Jews, book 17 through 20, The Life of Flavius Josephus. It says, Besides these signs, a few days after that feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month Artemisius, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable nature as to deserve such signals. For before the sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running out about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking, and heard a great noise, and after that they heard the sound of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. When you get the idea of quaking, I'm, I'm imagining the sound of bodies coming out of the ground. They're, they're shaking the earth as they're doing this, and now they're saying, Let's remove hence, and this huge multitude in the middle of the night is it gets swept away. Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, writes about the same event in 66. Now, he was a Roman general um, and historian, and I believe he was a uh, senator, too. Uh, and his, he was very skeptical of religions. His job was to oversee religions and keep them in check in Rome. But he, he was known to be very factual in his works. Well, he saw the same event that Josephus does. He says prodigies had occurred, but their exp expiation by the offering of victims of solemn vows is held to be unlawful by a nation which is a slave of superstition and the enemy of true beliefs. In the sky appeared a vision of armies in conflict, of glittering armor. A sudden lightning flash from the clouds lit up the temple. The doors of the holy place abruptly opened. A superhuman voice was heard to declare that the gods were leaving it, and in the same instant came the rushing tumult,
of their departure. Few people placed a sinister interpretation on this. The majority were convinced that the ancient scriptures of their priests alluded to the present as the very time when the Orient would triumph and from Judea would go forth men destined to rule the world. That's in Histories, Book 5, Verse 13. Wow. So we have, we have three accounts here. We got Cassius Dio writing of, with Nero that they saw these bodies coming out of the ground. You have Josephus describing that the earth shook and that this great multitude saying, let us remove hence. And then you've got Tacitus who records that the doors of the temple abruptly opens. Now keep in mind, in Revelation it describes that the bodies of the saints were below the temple. You have the, the doors of the holy place abruptly opening and a superhuman voice, you know, that, that voice of a multitude, was heard to declare that the gods were leaving it. He probably thought they were gods, but they were probably just, just resurrected bodies, just new spiritual bodies. And in the same instant came the rushing tumult of their departure. By the way, what does this remind us of? If you look at 2 Peter 3.10, it says, and it will come the day of the Lord as a thief in the night in which the heavens with a rushing noise will pass away and the elements with burning heat be dissolved and the earth and its work shall be burnt up. This is really interesting because we have Josephus describing this event as happening at night. We have Tacitus described it, is describing it as a rushing tumult of their departure. And, uh, and this is happening in the temple, which the Jews understood as a symbolic form of heaven and earth. So we have a historical event that seems to describe the kind of resurrection we're imagining. This is amazing. So we, we have this idea that the resurrection doesn't have to look the way we thought it did. We weren't meant to live on earth forever. We were meant to live on heaven. We weren't going to be waiting in heaven until we get new bodies on earth. We're going to be waiting in, we were going to be waiting in Hades or Sheol until the heavens open up and then we get our new spiritual bodies and go to heaven. The final idea is that we don't have bodies that are 100% visible and tangible all the time and can never be anything else. We have uh, our spiritual bodies are going to be capable of being invisible, tangible, or in between. And, and this leads, this allows these kind of events to line up with such a description. The, the, the thing that's discouraging is when people say that the resurrection hasn't happened. That's indirectly saying that when we die, we have to wait in Sheol or Hades. And N.T. Wright quotes, you know, hints at this several times. If you were to ask him, where do the dead go? Uh, he's not going to directly say we go to heaven because he sees verses like this. And he's like, well, it looks like the New Testament says they're still waiting in Hades or Sheol. Uh, and of course, that's a little uncomfortable to say. So I don't think he outright spells it out super clearly. But this is good news because if the resurrection has happened, then Sheol is done with. According to Revelation 20, Sheol and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire after, after the saints came out and received their new spiritual bodies and went into the kingdom of heaven and, and heaven for eternity. And Revelation 14, 13 describes what happens to us today when we die. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. If you compare this to Ecclesiastes, you have, you have um, Solomon basically saying there's no hope in the afterlife, for there is no memory or work or deed or anything like that. But this is saying that, that we'll be conscious. It's saying our good deeds will follow us and we'll rest from our hard work. This is kind of describing a very peaceful afterlife. So, all in all, we have a reason to be very hopeful. We've believed as Christians growing up that we go to heaven when we die, and rightly so. We do go to heaven, and now we can prove it scripturally. That is what I wanted to share. Now, I know that imagining in a resurrection that has happened is really difficult for a lot of people, and it was difficult for me. But this is perhaps one way we can view it that will allow us to set our minds at rest, that hey, Jesus, in fact, could have returned in that generation and risen the dead, and we would have historical proof for it, and we would be able to believe it in peace. So anyway, that's, uh, that's our second episode. If you'll stick with me through the third part,
we'll get to look into uh, the great white throne judgment. And, uh, and uh, it will be our stepping stone into the thousand year reign and Satan's demise. So uh, stick with me for that. And uh, hopefully that will come out within the next year. <laughs> I'm not very good at keeping up with these videos, but hopefully I'll get it out sooner than that. But uh, thanks for sticking with me and uh, wish you a good day.